You're listening to the Luca's Italy podcast with food, culture and history from the land of Leonardo and Limoncello. This week, I'll be talking about how Mediterranean Italy bizarrely fell in love with preserved fish from thousands of miles away. A few nights ago, on the 24th of December, Italians would have been settling down to eat the Ceinone della Vigilia di Natale, their big Christmas Eve meal, which for many Italians is the main meal of the Christmas festival. In the region of Campania, which is the area around the city of Naples, many people would have started their meal with pieces of fish fried in batter known as bacala fritto. Bacala is something that you find in Italy on menus up and down the country, and not just for Christmas. But what actually is it? Well, it depends which part of Italy you're in. If you're in the Veneto region in northeastern Italy, then it actually refers to dried Atlantic cod, which comes mostly from the Lofoten Islands in Norway. In the rest of Italy, this is known as stocca fisso, and Italy is actually the largest importer of this in the world. In the rest of Italy, bacala refers to salt cod from mostly Iceland, Norway, Greenland or the Faroe Islands, and Italy is actually the second largest importer of this in the world. So how did these two preserved fishes come to feature in the traditional cooking of Italy, a country which is literally surrounded by fresh fish? Well, it all goes back to a tragic incident which occurred in the year 1431, and we know about this because there are two official documents which have survived, written by eyewitnesses, which tell us the story. On the 25th of April, 1431, the Venetian merchant ship Querina, under its captain and owner Pietro Querini, left Crete bound for Flanders with a cargo of wood. They had a crew of 68 men. On the 3rd of June, the ship was entering the Spanish city of Cadiz, when, due to a pilot error, it struck a submerged rock, damaging the keel, and they had to spend several weeks in Cadiz having the keel repaired. What nobody realised, however, was that the hinges which held the rudder in place had also been damaged. On the 14th of July, they left Cadiz, and by November they had arrived at the entrance to the English Channel. On the 9th of November, just as they were about to enter the channel, a huge storm blew up and it blew the ship off course around the Scilly Islands and the west coast of Ireland, and at this point the rudder broke. The storm lasted for weeks, blowing them further and further out into the Atlantic. They tried fixing the rudder to no avail, they had problems with the mast, they managed to lose their anchor, um, their sails were damaged, and in the process also sadly two men died. The eyewitness accounts describe this in great detail. 29th of November. The storm was intolerable. Its cursed course once again deteriorated, and it ripped from the mast our second sail, which we had rigged together with the fragments of the first one. We improvised a third sail from the remains of this one, which wasn't as much a sail as a kind of poor copy of one exposed to the wind. And in reality, it was next to useless. And in this parlous state, we remained until the 4th of December, the Feast of Santa Barbara. They had two small lifeboats with them, one which they call a skiff, and the other one which they call the boat. And they decided that they should abandon ship and that they should divide themselves between these two smaller vessels. So on the 18th of December, they abandon the ship and 21 of the men get into the skiff and 45 of them into the boat, carrying all the rations that they can, they can manage. During the night, the two ships got separated by the sea and the accounts continue from people who were in the boat. It wasn't until the 3rd of January that they spotted some land, and on the 5th of January they made landfall on a small island, an uninhabited island known as Sandoy, which is in the Lofoten Islands of Norway. Over the next couple of weeks, unfortunately many of them died. By the 1st of February there were 11 of them left. 
It was on this date that, by chance, two fishermen from the neighbouring island of Rust were on Sandoy and they discovered them. So the Venetians found themselves in the midst of a Norwegian fishing community and they managed to communicate with them through the priest who was German and obviously being a Catholic priest spoke Latin. In his account, Pietro Querini describes the two fish which the fishermen catch on the island. The first, which they catch in greater quantity, they call stockfish. The second fish is the flounder, but huge, weighing up to 200 pounds apiece. The stockfish are quite fatty, but dry. And they dry them in the wind and the sun, without salt, and they become as hard as wood. When they want to eat them, they beat them with the back of a cleaver, shredding them like we would nervi, and they add butter and spices to flavour them. Interestingly, the way that Quirini describes them cooking the bacala sounds very much like bacala mantecato, which is one of the two main ways that stockfish is eaten today in Venice. The word mantecato literally means buttered. So the Venetians had to stay on the island, living with the inhabitants, until May, when the weather was good enough for the inhabitants to take their dried stockfish to sell in mainland Scandinavia. The accounts both say that the Venetians were treated really well by the islanders and that they lived in their houses with them as part of their families. And when the time came for them to leave, everybody was quite sad. Querini says that a couple of days before they left, the wife of a chief of a neighbouring island sent him a gift. The lady sent one of her chaplains on a 13-oared boat to me as the leader of the group, bringing 70 stockfish which had been dried in the wind and also three round loaves of rye bread and a cake. The chaplain explained that he had come expressly because the news had reached the lady that we'd been treated poorly by the islanders where we'd ended up. We excuse the islanders, who of course were innocent. However, we thanked the lady and praised her behaviour. I found an amber rosary that I'd bought at Santiago de Compostela whilst on pilgrimage, and I sent it to the lady so that she could pray for our safe passage. On the 14th of May, 1432, they left Rust with the fishermen taking the stockfish over to the mainland. And um, unfortunately, a few hundred miles out into the sea, they found wood which they recognised as belonging to the wreck of the skiff. And so they realised that their 21 companions from whom they'd been separated had sadly drowned. After a long journey, they finally made it back to Venice. And on the 12th of October, 1432, Querini and his men finally arrived back in the lagoon city. He still had his 70 stockfish, which the lady had sent to him, and so he decided to sell them. And they became very, very popular, and a trade route quickly sprang up between Venice and Lofoten. It appears then that the Stoccafiso then trickled down from Venice into other parts of Italy. This is probably how it made its way to the port city of Ancona, where today we find a traditional dish called Stoccafiso all'Anconetana, in which the stockfish is cooked in a kind of stew with olives and onions and today potatoes and tomatoes. Sixty years later, Christopher Columbus made his epic voyage across the Atlantic, and within five years, the English decided that they wanted to get in on the act. So in 1497, um, the King of England, Henry VII, sent um, a Venetian sailor, Juan Caboto, or John Cabot, with a ship over the Atlantic to see what he could find. What he did find is the island of Newfoundland, where he discovered that the native people were drying cod, Atlantic cod, this time with salt because the, the atmosphere in Newfoundland, the air isn't quite as dry as it is in the Lofoten Islands. And this salt cod found its way back across the Atlantic, where it became very popular in Spain and Portugal. In 1536, the 
Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, who was also King of Spain, made a visit to the house of Cardinal Campeggi in Bologna. And we know that his cook, his chef, Bartolomeo Scappi, who later would be the chef to six popes in Rome, served a dish which he calls merluce alla spagnola, alessate e coperte in mostarda. This translates as Spanish-style cod, boiled and covered in a sweet mustard sauce. And if you read the recipe, it's clear that what we're talking about here is the salt cod bacala. So we know that by 1536, it had found its way to Bologna, which was part of the Papal States with its capital in Rome. Between the 15th and 18th centuries, many parts of Italy, north and south, were either under the influence of or directly ruled by the Spanish. And so we can imagine that the salt cod bacala made its way into Italian cuisine at this point. And in fact, the name bacala seems to come into Italian from Spanish, although it seems to ultimately derive from the low German word bacaliao, which means stick fish. This is the same meaning as the Norwegian stockfish, and both of them refer to the fact that once dried, the fish goes as hard as wood, as was noted by Pietro Querini in his account of the shipwreck. At some point, the Venetians started calling their version also bacala, again probably through Spanish influence. We know that this happened before the 18th century because it's mentioned in a play by Carlo Goldoni, the great Venetian playwright. In the final scene of his 1762 play, Baruffe Chiozzote, one of the characters who's being pressurised to marry a young lady says, I wouldn't marry her if you beat me. The young lady says in an aside, Mono zele cose da pestar loco fa il bacala, which translates as, ah, we don't have the things to beat him like we do the bacala. You'll remember, of course, that in Pietro Querini's account, he talks about the local people beating the bacala with the back of a cleaver in order to tenderize it before cooking. It's interesting that if you go to Venice today, there's a bridge called uh, Ponte delle Guglie over the Canareggio Canal, and on one side you can see some bollards which appear to have been put there to stop cars driving into the water until you realise that, of course, in Venice there are no cars. But there used to be a small fish market on that site, and these bollards are actually posts on which people would beat the bacala to tenderise it before selling it. So, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, today you find bacala all over Italy in almost every region has a traditional dish using it. As I noted, Italy is the second largest importer of the salt cod version and the largest importer of the dried version from Lofoten. In fact, the people of the island of Rust in Lofoten still remember and recently put a monument up to Pietro Querini because the trade with Italy is so important. Today, there are almost as many ways of cooking bacala as there are towns in which you can eat it. In Rome, for example, you find it fried in a crispy batter and it's eaten as a traditional antipasto when you go out for pizza. In Venice, there are two main dishes. The first one is called bacala mantecato, in which the stockfish has been boiled in milk and then whipped up um, in a pestle and mortar to form a really fluffy mixture, which is then served on bread or polenta. And there's also a version called bacala alla Vicentina, which is from the city of Vicenza, in which it's a kind of stew. In Tuscany, there's a dish called bacala alla Livornese, which is from the city of Livorno. We've already mentioned stocca fisso all'anconetana. And you find it in many different variations in the southern regions of Italy. These were all part once of the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, which was directly ruled for many years from Spain. So next time you're in Italy and bacala is on the menu, um, please remember poor Pietro Querini and the 57 poor souls lost on the Querina who brought bacala first to Italy and made imported preserved fish very, very popular 
am part of the traditional cuisine in a country where literally there are plenty more fish in the sea. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please don't forget to subscribe. And if you would like to rate and write a review in the Apple Podcast Store, that would be amazing. I'll be back next week with some more Italian food, culture and history. And I'd like to take this opportunity to wish all of you a very happy new year. Buon anno a tutti. And let's hope 2021 is a much better year than 2020. Ciao.